my dancers taught me how to do this. I'm just going <laughs> to. I, I still haven't downloaded Snapchat, but I don't know. <laughs> figure it out. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. I actually wasn't expecting anyone to show up because of the inauguration, um, so now I really wish I had prepared talk. <laughs> um, when I was told that the theme for this month is mystery, I seriously considered uh, doing like a performance art style lecture where I just freestyle the whole thing and then tell you guys that the mystery is uh, what's, what's um, going to come out of my mouth. <laughs> which is still kind of I'm considering doing, but uh, we'll see. If things are going really poorly, I will break out into interpretive dance, um, and that's how you know. Okay, so let me start by introducing myself um, and what I do. As Reed already said, I'm Mylin, and I know what you're thinking. Um, she looks familiar. You may have seen me on this small billboard in the darkest corner of a dingy BART station while rushing about your busy life. I imagine it's gone by now, so don't beat yourself up if you never saw it. Um, so I'm a lawyer by day at an environmental nonprofit, and by night, the director of the Mudwater Project, which is a dance theater group made up of ballet dancers and turfers. I also dance myself, and rather than give you an awkward live demonstration, I'm just going to show you an awkward video clip. <laughs> That's me in mock trial. Um, <laughs> I would tell you the backstory behind this behavior, but I don't remember why this is happening. <laughs> so, um, enough about me. Let me present to you the Mudwater Project. Just a quick note about that. I'm, I'm pretty big on improvisation, actually. So um, the violinists were improvising, um, and they had never met each other before. Uh, the dancers were also structurally improvising. Um, and we just kind of came together at a BART station um, 45 minutes before we went into the trains and performed. <laughs> so um, the project is now starting its second year of development. And God willing, the cycle will result in our first uh, full evening length performance at uh, Dance Mission Theater, which is just one BART stop over from here on March, March 4th and 5th. And tickets are up, uh, on sale right now. Um, so rather than get into too much detail about the project itself, I want to talk about why it began. Um, basically, the story begins with me quitting my job at a law firm I had been working for. Fairly cushy job as far as attorney jobs go, meaning it was still really stressful and awful most days. But I didn't have to work every weekend, and it came with a decently fat paycheck. Um, I left the job because one day, this feeling inside of me appeared. 
and I felt it here in my stomach, and I was pregnant. Just kidding, I wasn't. <laughs> I, the, the doctors checked. I mean, I guess I was pregnant with the mud water project. <laughs> um, and, and for months, this, this feeling just got heavier and heavier, and deep down, I knew what it meant, but I didn't want to acknowledge it because it was scary. Um, it meant I wasn't doing what I was meant to be doing. And that's true of most people. Most of us are doing what we are not meant to be doing. Um, for example, most of us are not meant to be sitting all day indoors, in offices, in front of screens, 10 hours a day, five days a week. Um, but most of us have a switch that overrides all that, all of the not meant to's. Um, and that switch allows us to keep working past the stress, past the carpal tunnel syndrome. And um, for some reason, I wasn't born with a very high functioning switch. Um, I do have one, that's how, I, that's how I got through law school, but it is sort of a weak one. So for example, most people could do a job that they're not completely in love with for um, 10 years, 20 years, maybe even 30. I found that I can go for about two, <laughs> basically about as long as I can fool myself into believing that I don't yet know for sure that this job isn't for me um, and that I'm still testing the waters. But once any part of me figures it out, that I'm not in love with the work and will never be, then uh, it's like that switch just stops working and I have to go. So I quit my job uh, without telling my parents or my family. Um, they, they actually still don't know, and it's been about two years. <laughs> um, by the way, that is a reoccurring theme you will find if I were to tell you enough stories. Um, and if I just keep going back in time every few years, you'd see this pattern where I'm at this point uh, where I'm confronted with a choice. I can either choose to stay in the somewhat known, the familiar, the predictable, or to venture into the great unknown. And so far what I've done is like dipped my toes into the unknown while playing it pretty safe. Um, and what's kept me from just straight up diving into the unknown as much as it intrigues me is that I always have someone there to remind me of how the world works. Um, <clears throat> when I was young, it was my Vietnamese immigrant war refugee parents and all of my friends who had the same kind of parents. And then when I was about to graduate from college, where I was secretly studying dance, um, I recall one of our professors telling us, if you can do anything else, and she was referring to anything other than a career in the arts, if you can do anything else, anything at all, please do that. <laughs> but if there is absolutely nothing else, then, um, you know, I don't know if she ever finished that sentence, but I, <laughs> but I, I, I heeded her advice and I decided to go to law school instead, um, which, as hard as it sounded, still seemed way easier than going out there into the, the great unknown and being an artist. And keep in mind that this cowardly decision to go to law school was the culmination of 20-something years, my whole life at that point, of being told that my world is this big and that these are the options to choose from. And uh, <clears throat> here it comes, the infamous millennial whining. <laughs> you, know, you know which idea it is that millennials get the most shit for? Um, that they're special snowflakes. They're, there's this video with Simon Sinek, or Sinek uh, floating around the internet recently about all the things that are wrong with millennials. I don't know if you've all seen it, but I think it was called What's Really Wrong With Millennials? <laughs> the number one problem being that they think they are all special and we can't all be special. Um, and that's my topic for today's talk. This misconception that it's impossible for everyone or everything to be special, which is actually a symptom of our obsession with our own technology. And I'm not talking about the Industrial Revolution. We could take it back as far as the invention of words or language. Um, before we had words, I mean, imagine a time before we had words, we would just have to see everything and every moment as an entirely unique existence or experience. But once we created words, then we could start reducing things into 
oversimplified categories or generalizations. So any redwood tree you come across is just another red redwood tree. Any given Tuesday is just a Tuesday. And every time you see these words, or every time you use these words, labels, all you're really doing is stripping something down to the very few characteristics that your modern day human brain can handle processing or remembering. So basically, in order to process the things you encounter with the minimal effort, you have to stick it into a category. And in order to maximize the number of categories your brain can hold, you simplify, you reduce, you get rid of the nuances, the richness, the details, the complexities, the layers, the depths, and instead you sloppily create these divisions between everything based on whatever simple superficial criteria like shape, size, color. And this kind of classifying, labeling, generalizing really affects our perception of reality. And that includes the perception that we are separate. We create words to represent ourselves. We create words to represent others. Therefore, we actually are separating ourselves from while reducing ourselves and reducing everything else. And in that process, we dehumanize, which then, of course, makes it easier for us to exploit, injure, kill. And we, we actually go over this in the Mudwater Project, how this is where the symptoms of racism and capitalism start. Um, racism, and I'm not talking on the individual level, I'm talking about racism on the systemic structural level. That sort of racism is the vehicle for capitalism, which depends entirely on exploitation. Um, but doesn't that thesis sound crazy? Like, can you imagine running up to someone and saying, oh my god, the root of all racism is words. Um, <laughs> but, in, but in this way, words are very powerful, ironically, because words are limiting. Their scope of meaning must be finite. So obviously, not only are your choice of words really important in terms of uh, communicating your beliefs and thoughts to others, but also they really limit your perception of the thing you are speaking about. Um, so words are destructive as they are creative, perhaps more so destructive, but um, as one of my favorite authors, Charles Eisenstein, who actually introduced this idea to me, this is not to advocate the abolition of words, only a caution to be mindful of their relative unreality. And so now I want to go back to this notion that it's impossible for us all to be unique. Um, we cannot all be special. I want us to think about what purpose this notion or this propaganda even serves. If you are not a special snowflake, then what are you? You're a worker of some sort and a hard worker at that. And the, in the best case scenario, you are the best worker. You climb the ladder above all the other lazy and or less talented workers and you are the top worker and you earned it. Therefore, none of us above or below can complain about the cards we're dealt. What we can do is keep our heads down and our noses to the grindstone and earn, meaning work, our way to our happiness because that must be the solution to our unhappiness or dissatisfaction, money and success, right? Um, most of us go through elementary school, middle school, high school, um, in some cases college and maybe graduate school. And at the end of it all, we're supposed to go find someone else to work for, to seek approval from, to be pushed by, to learn from, because we're avoiding the unknown. Because we're not supposed to believe in ourselves, which also includes a lot of unknowns. And it's that belief that the world stops here, and that if you venture beyond the unknown, you'll likely fall off the face of the earth. That keeps us from working within the machine. And that is basically what we're born into, a giant machine thing. And the only way our world is willing to tolerate us is if we find our place in it, um, which likely entails being forced to do things we're not really meant to do. Therefore, in such a world, the idea that each of us is unique or special and has a unique or special purpose is laughed at. And for those of us who don't have that switch, that numbing switch that overrides our design, our purpose, and allows us to just accept that life is about survival, and survival in this day and age means doing a lot of things you're not meant to do, that is a very, very depressing thing. So if there are any of you out there sitting um, with a crappy switch, 
meaning you feel frustrated that you're even mildly dissatisfied with your job, um, but you don't want to be a quitter or a whiner because your parents sucked it up and worked and your friends are doing it and everyone around you is able to do it, I just want you to know you're not alone. Um, so now I want to circle back to my own story. Um, so mud, the Mudwater Project began when I was unemployed after I quit my first job. Um, and it was, it was really scary, but it allowed me to decide for myself um, what I was going to do. I mean, while I was un unemployed, the doors just kind of all opened. And um, it was like I was coming back to that question when I was graduating from college, am I going to go into the arts or am I going to go into the known? And uh, this time I decided to try both <laughs> at the same time. Um, so currently I am still working as an attorney, but at least now I'm at an environmental nonprofit and that feels somewhat better. I'm fighting for a good cause and yet, despite liking the people and causes I work for, recently that feeling in my stomach has returned. Still not pregnant. <laughs> And what's frightening about the feeling reappearing now is that I don't have excuses to make this time about how it's the clients or the stress, meaning being an attorney is always stressful, um, but now you know, I am my own client and I work with a bunch of activist hippies and they're all awesome. Um, but given that the feeling has returned, that means I don't, probably don't have much time left at this job, um, knowing me. And you know, it, it really helped me to see, doing both, what it feels like to be doing what I'm meant to be doing, to be fed spiritually by my work, to be ecstatic as I'm toiling away endlessly. Um, I read this book a few years back called Mastery by Robert Greene. Some of the greatest geniuses or most special snowflakes we've had in history, such as Leonardo da Vinci, Mozart, Albert Einstein, um, et cetera, were not actually special. They, as in, they weren't superior humans. Um, they simply found what they were meant to do and they were lit inside and that gave them this boost of energy to focus intensely and work endlessly and that really spoke to me. If I had just got by Malcolm Gladwell's thing about spending 10,000 hours on whatever, then frankly I'd be really depressed because then I'd have no explanation for why I don't have the discipline to force myself to sit at a piano for 10,000 hours, other than that I must be a lazy, unambitious loser because I can't do it. Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm just not meant to play the piano. I'm instead meant to do this. I, I could break into an interpretive dance right now if you guys wanted. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to do it to white noise. Thank you.